This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. Not so long ago, global carbon dioxide rose a shocking 40 parts per million in just a few decades. Humans were alive then, but ecologically speaking, we were just animals. Scientists are rushing to find the cause of that natural instability and whether it could happen again. From Australia, Dr. Laurie Menviel explains. I'm Alex Smith. Find the future here on Radio EcoShock. Radio EcoShock. The Great Southern Ocean reaching down to Antarctica has absorbed up to 10% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Without that, we would be much hotter already. But that ocean sink appears to be weakening. In a worst-case scenario, scientists are exploring why carbon dioxide jumped 40 parts per million in a few decades and not that long ago, and whether that natural increase in warming gases could happen again. Dr. Lori Menviel is a leading scientist in the field with many papers. She is currently a researcher at the University of New South Wales in Australia, Lori was just awarded the 2019 Dorothy Hill Medal for her work as a groundbreaking young scientist. From Sydney, Lori Menvia, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Your field of study, it seems huge to me. How would you describe your work? Uh, well, I'm interested in periods of abrupt climate change and particularly in the role of the oceanic circulation. So most of my research focuses on constraining changes in oceanic circulation and understanding their impact on climate, the carbon cycle, and the continental ice sheet. Well, today we come to you out of concern for our common climate future, but to get there, we do need to examine relatively abrupt climate shifts in the past. Please tell us about the brand new record of past climate published by a big team led by A.P. Hasenfratz. Yes, so Hasenfratz recently uh, published his exciting new records. So Hasenfratz and Carter present a 1.5 million years record from the Southern Ocean. So they took a, a marine uh, sediment core in the Southern Ocean and they analyzed both surface and deep changes in temperature and the oxygen isotopic uh, composition, which is here a proxy for salinity. So from there, they can infer changes in, uh, or past changes in ocean stratification in the Southern Ocean. So what they find is an increase in Southern Ocean stratification during glacial times as Earth's climate went through a, a fairly large transition whereby the glacial times became much more intense. So this is known as the middle places in transition. So basically, their study, what it does, it highlights the possible role of uh, uh, changes in Southern Ocean stratification in the climate and the carbon cycle. You know, as a lay person, it appears from reading your papers that in Earth's latest glacial times and, and what you're describing, the planet's climate went a bit rogue. It was departing from that previously predictable cycle caused by our orbit and our tilt. What do you think changed? Yeah, so basically over the last, let's say, million years and even, even more than, than that, Earth's natural viability has been dominated by what we call glacial interglacial cycles. So due to Earth's orbit around the sun, uh, we do go from relatively warm period interglacial down to cold period glacial. But there are feedbacks within the Earth systems that amplify those cycles. And those are changes in continental ice sheet and in greenhouse gases, so namely atmospheric CO2 or uh, methane. And so what happened is that, let's say, before um, this transition, the misplaced us in transition, which occurred somewhere in between 1.2 million years and 700,000 years ago, so before this transition, there were glacial interglacial cycles, but with a fairly small amplitude, both in terms of climate and CO2. And when we went through this transition, glacial uh, became much more severe, so it became much more cold, uh, much colder, and uh, atmospheric CO2 was also much lower. So we're trying to understand what happened, and in fact, the community is still really trying to fully comprehend the transition. But what comes out of it is that we know that atmospheric carbon dioxide is a very strong greenhouse gas and can impact significantly the climate. And we know that 
it decreased significantly, and this could be due to several effects, um, one of them being changes in the oceanic circulation in the North Atlantic. So North Atlantic deep water maybe became uh, weaker and shallower. We also know that maybe iron fertilization in the Southern Ocean increased, so uh, boosting up the production in the Southern Ocean, which then leads to more carbon storage in the ocean and less carbon in the atmosphere. And what just uh, what Azenfrat highlighted is also a changes in Southern Ocean stratification, so most likely a weaker circulation in the Southern Ocean, which can also lead to more carbon storage in the ocean and less in the atmosphere. Well, I think this is a really important point because we have what was predictable by our position in space and and the way the sun operates, and then we go into a period which just humans evolved during this period where something on Earth itself changed. And, and so we're very concerned that changes right here on Earth could again happen. And is that why you're doing your research? Well, yes. So what, what we're trying to really understand is the feedbacks and that occur in the Earth system. So what glacial interglacial cycle show us is that there are what we call positive feedbacks. And so if you change something, then it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, it's not only positive because, obviously, when we are in a very cold period, then we become it becomes warm again very quickly. So, so there are these series of feedbacks and interaction within the climate system that can lead to sometimes rapid changes or, or etc. So, yes, this, this period is really important to understand, just to understand the Earth system, how it works, and if we understand better that, then we can better predict what's going to happen. If we look at just the northern hemisphere, how big were those changes between deep glacial times and the interglacial periods, say, in temperatures? How much did things vary? Well, if you look at the equator, the changes were fairly small. Let's say about, or let's say in the tropics, they were in between 1 to 2 degrees Celsius in the ocean. But as you move towards uh, the poles, they become larger and larger, and Ice core record from Greenland suggests maybe up to 20 degrees Celsius changes, so fairly large, and maybe about the same in Antarctica. And did that take thousands of years, or how fast did those changes happen? So there are several kind of variability, but if we look at the glacial interglacial variability, we know a deglaciation, so a transition from a full glacial to an interglacial takes about 10,000 of years in total. But there are periods within that where there is a much more rapid warming. So it's not like a, a constant and slow change in temperature. It's more like a period, maybe you, you go back into a colder state and then suddenly it becomes very warm again and then it changes. So we have seen in the record, um, let's say, periods of abrupt warming in Greenland, for example, where you can have a, a temperature increase of about 8 degrees Celsius in just a few decades, so in less than 100 years. It's also much, you can have very rapid warming. For most of us, it's surprising to learn that the Earth doesn't always warm or cool as a whole, but that the two poles seem to alternate do we know why a colder period in Greenland was accompanied by a warming closer to the South Pole? Yeah, so what happens is that within this glacial interglacial viability, we also have what we call periods of abrupt climate change, and, and those periods seem to be due to changes in the oceanic circulation. So right now we have formation of deep water in the North Atlantic, so in the Labrador Sea and the Nordic seas, and so this water becomes very dense and sink uh, to the bottom of the ocean and flow southward in the Atlantic. And so this, this oceanic, what we call this oceanic circulation, also drives uh, a surface flow. So there is a, a heat transport from the tropics to the North Atlantic, for example. So when this formation of deep water is fairly intense, we have fairly warm condition in the North Atlantic. For example, England, you have this so Gulf Stream, which is part of this circulation, brings heat from the tropics to uh, the UK, maintaining a fairly mild climate there. But we know that during past periods, this formation of 
deep water uh, weakened significantly or even maybe completely shut off. So when this happens, you completely reduce your heat transport to the North Atlantic and you have very cold conditions uh, over the whole North Atlantic, Greenland, Europe, etc. But since the ocean is, uh, is the one transporting the heat, if you wish, when you actually reduce your transport to the North Atlantic, you can keep more heat in the South in the Southern Ocean. So when you have this period of very strong cooling in the north, you have maybe warmer condition in the south. But there are uh, also things that, uh, I mean, details that we don't really fully comprehend. And and right now we always think about the Southern Ocean as as being passive simply, so just responding to changes in the North Atlantic. But this might not be so simple, and there might be changes in circulation in the south as well, influencing this uh, heat redistribution. And also one of the important aspects is that the atmospheric carbon dioxide composition might also change during this event, potentially influencing or amplifying the changes. Now, have you been studying solely a story at the poles? I mean, how do we know that at times the change was global? Yeah, so so there are, so not myself, but a lot of people study uh, climate archives. So if we want to look into what happened in the past, uh, we rely on those archives. So uh, there can be um, ice cores from the pole, as you say, from Greenland or from Antarctica, but there can also be marine sediment cores that are taken all over uh, the Atlantic Ocean or even in the Pacific and Indian Ocean. So when you analyze those marine sediment cores, you can see changes that happen at several places on Earth. And we also have terrestrial archives. So, for example, some archives that are very useful are speleothems. And we know from Chinese speleothems that the Asian monsoon changed significantly. Or we also know from speleothems in Turkey or Italy that uh, precipitation was significantly different during those periods of time. There are also lake records that can tell us so, or like records from Europe or from South America, for example. So we know that those events were global. And then what we use as well are uh, numerical simulations. So we use models, numerical models, and we try to reproduce what happened maybe in the North Atlantic or in the Southern Ocean. And then we understand um, what the drivers were and what the impact were, and we can see that the impacts were global. Most of the climate scientists are in the Northern Hemisphere still, and we know a lot more about the North Atlantic than the South Atlantic. I wonder if a bias has developed that favors the Arctic as a driver of big changes while leaving out some important developments in Australia and in the Antarctic. What do you think? Yeah, so it's an interesting point you're raising, and and obviously there is a bit of that, uh, and I think mostly in terms of the climate archive we have. So we have very good climate archive from Greenland, and a lot of sediment cores, marine sediment cores, have been taken from the North Atlantic. So we know that the North Atlantic was very um, viable, and we also know that the formation of North Atlantic deep water as a significant impact on climate globally. So this has been studied in quite a bit of details, and, and we try to have a kind of an idea that you know the North Atlantic is a significant uh, driver of global climate change. But uh, over the years, we're now starting also to understand that it's not only the North Atlantic, but the North Pacific, for example, can also have an impact on all of the Pacific, if you want, uh, climate and the Southern Ocean. So, so both regions are understudied, both in terms of climate archive and modeling, but we're, we're getting there. We are trying to, to realize that those regions can also have a significant impact, and we, we're working on it. <laughs> and we also, of course, have to take into account that... Uh, I mean, we know that the North Atlantic is a, is a significant driver, but it's been highlighted uh, over the recent years that the t- tropical Pacific is also very important. And if you think about El Nino Southern Oscillation, we know it has uh, it is a, one of the main modes of viability in the equatorial uh, Pacific and has significant impact through teleconnection on both the Southern Ocean and maybe other regions. So, yes, the, the climate system as a whole is, is kind of tied together Laurie Manfield, you have studied in detail the rapid transition from the last glacial time to our present climate. 
When did that happen, and how fast did it occur? Yeah, so the last transition, so what we call the last deglaciation from the last glacial maximum to our present interglacial occurred from about 18,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, so in about 8,000 years. But it was not a gradual change. As I say, we had um, abrupt climate variability within this transition, so when it went from colder to, to warmer, etc., do we know what caused a fairly quick burst of 40 parts per million carbon dioxide at the end of the last ice age? Yeah, so, so that's something that's very interesting. So just uh, at the end, to, so to get out of this glacial climate, there was an abrupt event in the North Atlantic, in fact, where, where we think the formation of North Atlantic deep water uh, weakened significantly. So uh, Greenland in Europe was in one of its coldest stage. Uh, right at the end of of, uh, the last glacial. But on the other hand, we see that uh, the southern hemisphere started to warm. So Antarctica started to warm, southern ocean became warmer, and atmospheric CO2, as you said, increased by 40 parts per million in just about a thousand years, with some, uh, within this period, with some parts that where we see a significant increase over just a few hundred years. And so the the hypothesis we put forward and uh, in in our modeling framework, but that's also been confirmed by some uh, climate archives, is that the changes in the upwelling in the Southern Ocean were a significant driver of this change. So so in the Southern Ocean, you have um, deep uh, water that are rich in carbon and nutrients that upwell. And so if this upwelling, so if you bring deep water to the surface in a more intense way, then you can have an outgassing of carbon from the ocean into the atmosphere, basically. And we think that's what what happened. So basically, there was a stronger circulation in the Southern Ocean, which drove more heat towards uh, Antarctica, so it's leading to reduction of sea ice, uh, warmer condition, and an outgassing of CO2. You are listening to Radio Ecoshock from the University of New South Wales in Australia. We are talking with the oceanographer, Laurie Menville. So, Laurie, let's talk about the ancient winds. What are the southern westerlies, and why do they matter to this study of climate? Yeah, so one of the main features of the circulation in the southern ocean are those westerly winds, right? And, and they drive the circulation in the southern ocean, bringing what we call an upwelling, so bringing deep water to the surface. And in the ocean in general, you have more carbon stored in the deep than at the surface. And at the surface, the water equilibrates always with the atmosphere. Okay, so when you bring this deep water, which has a lot of carbon to the surface, you expect an outgassing. So the ocean is uh, losing carbon while the atmosphere is gaining carbon. Several scientists on this program have presumed that as the world warms, strong westerly winds will tighten toward the South Pole, and that might change rainfall over Australia and rearrange the behavior of the Southern Ocean. Does that theory come from models, and how certain are we that that will happen? Uh, Well, there are several aspects to it. First, this is something that has been observed over the last two decades or so. So that's, I mean, I, I guess you're touching one important point here is that our instrumental record is kind of limited. We are, it's been, I guess, 10 to 20 years that our capabilities to observe uh, what's going on on Earth has increased significantly through satellites and, and other means of um, observation, but but our, our record is, is kind of short, so we need to go back in the past and, and try to get information to really see what's going on. But we, we think that over the last 20 years, the westerlies have, been, have increased in strength and have moved forward. And we can use also numerical models, so those numerical models that are developed in several countries all around the world, so in Australia, in the United States, in France, in Germany, etc., in the UK, uh, in China as well. So those models are then uh, run uh, forward in time to try to predict or project uh, what is going to happen. And I think most of the models suggest that those westerlies are going to keep on strengthening and and be closer to the pole. Of course, there's always... uh, 
some uncertainty associated to it. But this one seems to be a robust feature of the model. You know, other scientists suggest the availability of iron for carbon-grabbing plankton may have influenced the latest warm period. Why do you emphasize the role of winds instead? Well, I, I, I think... It's not necessarily instead. I mean, we know that the iron fertilization is an important aspect. So basically, the Southern Ocean is a special region in some aspects because it's um, what we call a high-nutrient, low-chlorophyll region, meaning that primary production is limited not by the availability of nutrients or macronutrients, but it might be limited by a micronutrient, which is iron. Uh, So if you add iron to the ocean, you expect that the phytoplankton can grow more quickly and this phytoplankton does photosynthesis and therefore capture carbon and bring it down to um, a depth. So so this is important and I don't think nobody denies it. Uh, It's just that there are also other aspects that are important and the winds uh, are an important part. So they are just driving also uh, the upwelling of nutrients to the surface and changing the condition, meaning if you have, let's say, a warmer southern ocean, you have conditions that are maybe more favorable also for uh, primary productivity if you have less sea ice and uh, warmer condition. Laurie, are there any signals that during the relatively recent abrupt climate change that we're talking about in the last deglaciation that the violence of storms increased? And if so, would that suggest we may experience more extreme storms if a similar shift towards those stronger westerlies and a changed ocean current happen? Well, that's a very difficult question. (laughs) So there is no record or nothing right now in our capability to see whether uh, storms were stronger or not. Of course, that's what you would expect, I would guess. If the westerlies are stronger, you you would expect more storms in the Southern Ocean. Now also the position of the westerlies is very important as to where the storms happen. So if you think about Australia, uh, so uh, we go into an area which is maybe not my specialty, but um, if you think about Australia and I think it will be more the location, the location of the maximum of the westerlies that will impact storms more than its strength. Let's say if it's shifted too poleward, uh, maybe storms will not reach directly Australia, etc. So that's one aspect of it. Now, for the future, of course, the strength of the westerlies will have an impact on the strength of the storm in the Southern Ocean. But again, if you go to mid-latitude countries, uh, so Australia or or other in South America, I don't necessarily know. I think uh, the mean sea surface temperature will have a significant impact, and I think that's what we've seen uh, in the recent in recent events. Is more an increase in mean sea surface temperature that can then generate uh, stronger storms. This is difficult because it, it depends a lot on which latitude you're looking into, which system you're going into. And so I'm really looking at a mean climate. And so the deviation or what what you look into extreme storm are another area of study. (laughs) I understand. Well, look, I began by saying that the southern oceans are grabbing about 10% of our current emissions, and thank goodness that they are. Can you tell us how the ocean manages to capture and store so much of our greenhouse gases? It it depends a lot on the difference in um, atmospheric carbon dioxide composition in between the atmosphere and the ocean. So what happened is that over the since the Industrial uh, Revolution, we've been adding carbon into the atmosphere at, uh, I think, about 2 gigaton per year. So the atmospheric composition in carbon dioxide has increased from about 280 ppm to 400 ppm, which is a concentration we haven't seen in, I would say, a million years. Right. So the natural viability of atmospheric CO2 over a glacial-interglacial cycle is 180 ppm to 280. So here we're going way higher. So you, you do change the sink and source of carbon when you do that. And as you say, thankfully, both uh, the terrestrial biosphere and the ocean have absorbed a lot of our emissions. So about 25 so I think 30% has been absorbed by the terrestrial biosphere and 25% by the ocean. 
and a lot of this carbon has been absorbed in the Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean is a very special uh, place because this is where you form both the Antarctic bottom water uh, and the Antarctic intermediate water, and in fact the subantarctic mode water. So when you form those waters, you have also the capability of absorbing carbon. Yeah, so basically we, we've, we've changed, if you wish, the, the natural... So, so we are putting so much carbon into the atmosphere that the ocean now, partial pressure, is lower than the atmosphere. So you're actually absorbing uh, some of this carbon. And a few years ago, British scientist James Lovelock warned about the ocean stagnating, breaking into layers called ocean stratification. Is that happening? Yeah, so that's that's another very uh, important point and a bit of concern, in fact, is that so what we have we have seen over the last 20 years and what you just said is that the southern hemispheric westerlies have strengthened and shifted poleward. Okay, so this has an impact of bringing more uh, carbon to the surface, so you have an outgassing of carbon. But on the other side, since uh, the circulation is fairly strong, you can also capture a lot of uh, anthropogenic carbon. But on the other side, what we've seen, and, and we're still trying to understand exactly why, is that the Southern Ocean has become more stratified and maybe uh, fresher. So indicating uh, potentially a slowdown of this uh, Southern Ocean circulation. So there are, in fact, almost two competing effects right now, is that one that is dynamic with the wind wanting to strengthen the Southern Ocean circulation, and one uh, that is coming from uh, maybe a meltwater input from Antarctica uh, wanting to stratify the Southern Ocean and slowing down this circulation. So in the future, if we look at uh, the coming 100 years or so, in fact, it's really unclear what is going to happen, and a lot of it will have to do into the freshwater budget close to the Antarctic coast. Your recent article published in the journal Science on March 8th talks about a nonlinear response. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is that basically we are not really sure where we're going, right? And we've seen in the past that Earth was able to go through rapid transition. In a few hundred years, we had you know, significant warming or significant increase in atmospheric CO2. And we're still trying to simulate that with our models and understand it. And sometimes we've highlighted some positive feedback. So if, if you go back to Antarctica and the Southern Ocean, we know that if you have an increase in stratification, it's possible to have uh, a warming in the subsurface, and this subsurface warming can then melt the ice shelf, and you can have, let's say, an increase in meltwater close to the Antarctic coast, further weakening the circulation and eventually leading to a significant loss of ice mass in the Antarctic. So this is, for example what could happen in a positive feedback case, right? So so right now, I think the concern is that we don't really know where we are going. We, uh, we have some ideas, and we are trying to simulate possible response, but there are still surprises coming, and I guess we hope that there are good surprises and not bad, um, because we're still lacking a lot of information on possible rate of change, particularly... Uh, continental ice sheet. We're going to have to leave it there. We have been speaking with award-winning young scientist Laurie Manviel from the University of New South Wales. Find links to the science we've talked about in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. Laurie, thank you so much for sharing your valuable time with us. Well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you, and I hope it was of interest. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.